seated in a minute. <clears throat> Caleb, I'm going to read a few verses here, so stick with me. John 8 and 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him and sat down, and he taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery. And the next little phrase always amazed me. In the very act. That's amazing, isn't it? Now Moses in the law commanded us that such, a, that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have some to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he, had, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, being beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. I know I got you standing. Let me tell you just two things. Our text verse is verse 9. Put it back up there, Caleb, verse 9. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing with him. I want to talk to you today about your conscience your conscience. They were convicted by their own conscience. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask today that you would please, please, Lord, instruct my mind to think the thoughts that I need to think today so that I might say the words that I need to say today so that you, through your Holy Spirit, could use those words to penetrate our hearts and speak to our conscience. Lord, and I pray today that life would come today as a result of this message. Where there has been darkness, let light be there. Where there has been death, let life come. And Lord, I pray that all of us, when we leave here today, we would have been glad that we came to your house. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this morning. Your conscience, your conscience, what is your conscience? Your conscience is the inner sense of what is right and wrong in one's conduct or motives, impelling one towards right actions or condemning one for wrong actions. Now, I'm going to do something today that I don't normally do because I know it is, it's a little uh, embarrassing to people, but... Uh, maybe maybe uh, it'll, it'll be okay. Just to demonstrate a little something short short here, I'm going to come down here. Brother Chris Wright, I'd like for you to help me if you would. Uh, just come on up here. And um, I'm going to demonstrate something to you. I picked him because he looks so fine. Don't he look good? Look at that. Look at that. You can turn around here. Just uh, a handsome fellow here. Uh, Brother Chris, is going. I'm, I'm going to show you something about us that um, where all this fits in, and then I'm going to let him go sit down and I'll, I'll preach here. But uh, we are, as people, made up of three components. And we know what those are. Those are body, soul, and spirit. 
body, soul, and spirit. We are, we are, we, we are a trichotomy. All three components make us who we are. Now, on the one side over here, we're going to say on this shoulder, you know, because everybody says, well, I got a good angel over here and a bad angel over here, you know, kind of thing. But we're going to, we're going to demonstrate here. On, 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 this, on his right side, let's let this represent the physical part of Brother Chris Wright. The physical part is uh, his body. And of the three components that we're made of, the body is the least important. Now, that's not to say it's not important. It is important because our bodies are the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, our temples of God. And that's the reason we as Christians say that you shouldn't put defile your body, you shouldn't do things to your body to, uh, to defile the temple. Um, however, the body, we all know, is going to perish. It is going to fade away and turn back to the dust from whence it came. We know that. But we're just, uh, we're in this body, and so it would be wise, I've always said, I, I would have taken a lot better care of my body when I was in my teens and 20s if I knew I was going to live this long. Because now I'm having to deal with aches and pains for things I did in abusing this body when I was young. But let's look at how the body relates. The five senses, what are they? Come on class, this is, this is your time to interact. Okay, touch, we, we touch things, we can feel, we touch things. Our sight, and then our hearing, our smell, and our taste. That's how this physical man relates to the world. That's how we uh, touch things and make things happen is because we have this physical body. But over here is the spirit man. And the spirit man, the only way that the spirit man has to really communicate with the world is through his conscience. But the soul of man is right up here in his brain. And this is where our soul has to be converted, the Bible says. When you get born again, when you get saved, your body does not get born again. That's what Nicodemus said. He said, how can a man be born when he's old? Does he enter the second time to his mother's womb? Obviously, that's ludicrous. And yet the Bible teaches when you come to Christ, you get born again. The Bible even goes so far as to say, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. What becomes new? The Spirit. So that conscience that was dead in trespasses of sin, it didn't have an awareness of, of, of God and what really God did, really wanted. It, it, we just lived and made decisions based over here on the physical part of things. But the mind was just constantly drawing from the, from the physical how we're going to make decisions. The soul of man, the body does not get born again, the spirit gets born again, and the soul does not get born again. The soul has to be converted, the Bible says. The law of the Lord converting the soul. So in this mind up here, the Bible tells us in Romans that be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your body. No. Your spirit. No. Your mind. By the renewing of your mind. Now in your soul or your mind, there's three components. It's the mind, will, and emotions. Those are the components that make up the soul of man. And the soul of man is the real you. That's where your personality comes from. That's where all your decision making comes from. Now, you've got two places to draw from to make decisions. You're either going to make decisions from the physical world or from the spirit world. Does this make sense? But your soul is what's going to be presented to God on Judgment Day. Not your body. you got to get a new body. Your spirit, it's going to return to the Lord who gave it, the Bible says. But your soul, the real you, your personality, who you are, that's going to be what's going to be presented to God. So today, I want to help you to understand a little bit more about you as to how you are coming to the conclusions you're coming to. Okay? 
Thank you, Brother Chris. You did a good job. Let's give him a hand. Thanks, Brother Chris. Now, so let me, let me, in way of just getting started, let me, let me tell you the warfare that goes on between the physical and the spirit. You go to the doctor, and the doctor says, Buddy, you're in bad shape. You need to lose 30 pounds, or we're going to have to put you on dialysis, or we're going to have to do this, that, the other to you. And you say, okay, doc, I will. I promise, I will. You leave the doctor's office, and you get hungry, and you stop by on the way home, and you, get some, you go to the, to the Golden Corral. And you tell yourself before you ever go in, I'm going to take the doctor's advice, and I'm going to, I'm going to cut back. And then you, uh, yeah, I'm just going to the salad bar. I'm going to stay away from the dessert table today. And you get to eating, and it ain't no time to where that, uh, that physical man starts getting uh, to feeling real good about things. And uh, the conscience steps up and says, uh, don't go back for seconds. Don't go back for seconds. But the, fear, the, the physical man says, I'm still hungry. And so the physical man overrules, and the conscience, we're telling the conscience, shut up. Shut up. Leave me alone. I'll do it tomorrow. Okay? And so we can all see this battle between our conscience and our physical drives. Right? Okay. Now, obviously, the physical man needs to eat, but the conscience does not need to be violated. Okay? Now, I, 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 I got to tell you something. Every one of you under the sound of my voice, you need to be careful who you get, take guidance from. Because as it relates to conscience, you can surround yourself with a group of people that they will just stroke your ego and they'll just tell you, you're doing great, you're doing fine, you're fantastic, everything's lovely. Be careful who you take guidance from. It reminds me of the story of the blind man. The blind man was... Uh, he, had, he was training this new CNI dog, and the CNI dog was, uh, uh, was doing real good until one day they was in New York City. And if you guys have ever been to New York City, when the light changes in New York City, there's literally hundreds of people that cross the street. It is the most crazy thing I've ever seen. Anyway, this guy's sitting there with the blind CNI dog, and he's, he's blind. He's got his you know, stick out, and he's holding. The, he's waiting, 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 and the light changes, and the dog just runs right out in the middle of the street and just stops. Horns are honking everywhere, and, and the blind, blind guy, he don't know what to do. He's, he's just sitting there, you know, kind of panicking. And, and a good Samaritan over here sees this happening and runs out in the street and takes the dog in one hand and the blind man in the other hand and walks him on across the street. And, and the blind man saying, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And then the good Samaritan sitting there looking at the blind man, and the blind man reaches in his pocket to get, he get, got, gets a treat out. And he goes to give a treat to the dog. And the good Samaritan said, you're definitely not going to reward that bad behavior in that dog, is it? Are you? He said, no. He said, but in order, he said, I need to locate his head in order to be able to kick his behind. <laughs> hey, listen, folks. It'd do a lot of us good to kick some folks in the behind that we've been allowing to influence us as it relates to our conscience. Amen? And, uh, you know, uh, well, I, I, could, I, I had some other things to say about that, but time's going to get away from us. And I don't want to, uh, I don't want to keep you too long. So let's just take a quick, quick, quick Bible study here, and then I'm going to get to the message. And the message is going to be pretty short. It'll be short as the Bible study here, but let's just take what the Bible says about conscience. There is, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. There's six things that I want to point out to you that the Bible talks about about our conscience. Number one, we can have a good conscience. In Acts chapter 23 in verse 1, the Bible says, And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Now obviously, if you read in context, he's talking about since he got saved, since he gave his life to the Lord, he said, I have walked in good conscience. So our conscience can be good. Secondly, we can have a condemning conscience. In Romans 2 and 15, the Bible says, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts 
the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. Your conscience can either affirm you or condemn you. When everybody else does not know what all the circumstances was, and it looks like that you did something wrong, but you and God knows that you did right, you can go to bed at night and lay your head on the pillow and know that you know that you know that it's, oh, it's okay because I did what was right. That's the beauty of a good conscience. Amen? On the other hand, conversely, it can look like to everybody that, boy, oh, what a great guy Gary is. What a great guy Gary is. But Gary knows in his heart that he lied to get that business deal. He cheated somebody to get, to get that approval. And then you go to bed at night and your conscience is gnawing on you even though everybody else thinks that, whoa, you did so good, you're a great guy. So your conscience can either affirm you or condemn you. Everybody on the same page here? All right. And I, I know this is a little bit like classroom study here, but we're going to get to some preaching here in a minute. So I said, number one, your conscience, you can have a good conscience. You can have a condemning or affirming conscience. Then the Bible talks about in Acts chapter 24 and verse 16 that we can have a clean conscience. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. A clean conscience is a conscience void of offense. You know what a clean conscience is for some people? It's no more than a bad memory. <laughs> Amen. Some people say, well, my conscience is clean. And when in all reality, it was just, you just forgot. You forgot what you said. You forgot what you did. That's not what having a real clean conscience is about. Amen. We can have a guilty conscience. And I think that we all realize what that's talking about. In Romans chapter 9 and verse 1, the Bible says, And I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. In other words, my spirit and God's spirit are affirming and they're bearing witness that what I said is true. And then the last thing, and this is... Uh, leading into the message today and this is the dangerous part brothers and sisters and please hear me your conscience can be seared okay do you understand what I mean by seared guys brother, brother Dave realizes this but he, he plays the guitar a little bit and people that play the guitar if they're not in if they hadn't picked up a guitar in a while and their fingers have gotten kind of soft they will actually go to the stove and they will sear the end of their fingers. Just gently sear the end of their fingers. And the reason is, is because picking those strings, if you've not, if you hadn't done it in a while, it'll, uh, it'll put blisters on you. It'll, it'll hurt. But by searing your fingers, what you're doing is you're numbing your, your senses. And now you can play without having the pain. And that's the purpose of searing your fingers. Uh, and your conscience, you can do the same thing. You can reject your conscience enough. You can ignore your conscience enough. And the Bible says it'll be seared with a hot iron. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, the, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, that is obviously not what we want to do to our conscience. Because we're going to make decisions based upon the physical drives or the spirit man. Right? If you only make decisions on the physical level... Animals only make decisions on physical levels. Angels are spirit beings. You're more angelic when you make decisions from the spirit world. <laughs> You're more animalistic when you only make decisions from the flesh. I mean, 
you take the woman that's you know been married four or five times. She says all men are dogs. I don't know why we always get referred to as dogs, but I guess what I guess what that's trying to be meant by that is is they're just driven by their instincts. <laughs> They don't have any conscience that they're really working with. They just seem to be physically motivated. I would ask you women to say amen, but I know that's a little bit, uh, that's calling you out a little bit. I won't do that. All right, now here's the message. The conscience is God-given. The conscience is God-given. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl has a conscience. And a lot of people think that the conscience, because it's God-given, it's really the only thing that we'll be accountable for is whether we violate our conscience or not. But a conscience is a compass. And let me tell you a really brief little story. When I was about 15 years old, Brother Eanes, a man in our church in Arkansas, he kind of took up with me and he'd take me hunting. I'd never been in the woods. My dad uh, never took me hunting in the woods and stuff. And he'd take me hunting, Brother Eanes would. And I'll never forget, he, he went and we went to the store and bought a compass. And he said, you're, he set me down, you know, you're going to need to know how to read this compass. And he explained to me how it's pointing north and this, that, and the other. And, and um, I, you know, got out there with the compass, and I turned, and see, he'd say, "Which way is north?" And I said, "It's that way." And he'd say, "You know, okay, which way is north? Which way are you facing?" And he he taught me how to look at look at the compass. He says, "Tracy, one of the last things he said before he let me out in the woods, he said, now this compass, you'll have to trust it. However, when you go to read it, do not put this compass near the the barrel of your gun." Because the magnetic field in that gun is going to mess up that compass. And sure enough, this was they may have different compasses now, Brother Josh, but back then you could take that compass and you could have your gun barrel over here and you could run that thing over that gun barrel and I don't care where where north was. When it got over that gun barrel, that was north. (laughs) It didn't matter which way you was facing, that was north. Now, what's the illustration there? The illustration is, is, yes, God gave you a compass. And in your heart of hearts, you know that lying is wrong. You know that stealing is wrong. You know that killing is wrong. But if you stay under the influences of people that have a seared conscience, a violated conscience, your conscience can get out of calibration. Did you know that there are cultures, total cultures of people that they, as a group of people, it is totally understood and normal that they molest all of their 13 to 15-year-old girls. There's whole cultures of people that do that. Now, you sit here in America, and you think to yourself, how could they not know that that is gross, that's wrong? I'll tell you how. Because somebody, somewhere, back up the line in a position of influence, did this and said it was okay. Okay. And then there was an uproar, but then after all that settled back down, then the next guy did it, and the next guy did it, and the next guy did it. Until then it just became, well, I guess this is the way it's going to be. We know that this is the case. If I were to poll you today in this room and ask you, do politicians lie, every one of you would raise your hand and say, yes, politicians lie. If I were to say, well, it's just Democrats that lie, you'd say, no, uh they all lie. You know why? Because it seems like all the the politicians that we know about lie. But just because it's the social norm, we need our conscience calibrated by the Word of God, not by what the norm is. Is somebody hearing me here this morning? You don't call right wrong or wrong right just because everybody's doing it. it. Wrong is wrong and right is right. But if you take that compass and you put it over over the the social norms, it gets out of calibration. I've heard so many people tell me, well, this is just the way we do it. This is just the way I am. Miss Peggy works down at the prison. I guarantee you that a lot of them guys down there think, well, it wasn't my fault. 
A lot of them do. A lot of them know. But a lot of them, are, they're convinced because th this is what everybody I knew did and this is what we do. This is just it. Your conscience needs to be calibrated by the Word of God, not by your social friends, your sphere of influence, social norms. It needs to be calibrated by the Word of God. There needs to be a standard outside of ourselves that tell us what is right and wrong. Because pleasing God is not a democracy. We don't all get here and vote on, well, let's see here. Is it right? Is this right? And we take whatever, whatever issue. Well, we can see the ludicrous in that. We can see the, the silliness in that, right? Right. But the Bible says it like this. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Even your own heart can be desperately wicked at times. And here's what we do. We quantify sin. We say, oh, even in prison, even in prison. I mean, the child molester, even in prison, is the scum of the earth. I mean, yeah, I, I robbed three banks and I shot two people, but I'm not like that guy. That guy's the scum of the earth. Well, let me tell you something. God is so holy. God is so holy that all sin is wicked in His sight. Amen? They're telling me I only got 10 minutes left? Y'all need to recalibrate your clock. So your conscience must be developed by the Word of God. I thank God for my mom and my dad, my mom especially. When I was a little guy, she was always telling me, Gary, you don't need to do that because Jesus, that hurts Jesus when you do that. You don't need to, you don't need to, you don't need to be like that because that, that doesn't make Jesus happy. And she put within me a desire to please Jesus at an early age. And my conscience, I had no problem accepting that God was just and God was holy because I had a love to want to please Jesus. And my, I was shaped to know that whatever the Bible taught, that was what was right. And let me tell you something. There ain't, there ain't no religious group, there ain't no social group that can knock the Ten Commandments. Every one of us under the sound of my voice today, regardless of what your background is, you know that the Ten Commandments is right. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't bear false witness. Covet not your neighbor's wife. I mean, those are just basic things that we know to be right. But if everybody does something other than that, and you, your goal is to try to feel good about yourself, then you can surround yourself with people that will just stroke you and tell you that you're good, you're all right. Now, you might ask the question, you might be asking yourself the question at this point, well, why in the world is he talking to us about this? I'll tell you why. Because until your conscience can be awakened towards God, you won't sense your need for God. And until you sense your need for God, you won't cry out to God to save you. And if you don't cry out to God to save you, you're going to die in a lost condition, according to the Scriptures. And you do not want to do that. In Isaiah, the Bible tells us, Come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be as white as snow. We, every one of us here today, have a sin problem. Every one of us have a sin problem. And you're, you can put a label on what yours is. I'll put a label on mine. We're not going to get up here and confess this is mine and you have to confess this is yours. I'm no priest <laughs> and I couldn't absolve anybody's sins if I wanted to. Amen. But I'll tell you this. We have a problem with sinning. And if we violate our conscience when we do wrong and the conscience comes and says that wasn't right, then you've got to either clean it up or cover it up. That's your choices. You clean it up or cover it up. And if you cover it up, the Bible tells us, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. 
You're not going to be right with God if you cover up your sin. And you ladies, you know exactly what I mean. When you tell your kids to go clean the room, and you go in there, and you, clean, you look at the room, and it looks pretty clean, and then you roll back the, the, the covers, you roll back the carpet, I mean, you lift up the rug, or you open the closet doors, that was a great cover-up. Right? But that didn't clean the room. It cleaned up the outside, but it didn't do nothing to clean up the inside. And I'm not as concerned about, I'm not, that's what I hate about Western medicine. And if anybody here is in the medical field, please, this is not an attack against you. If you're a doctor, it's no, no attack against you. But I hate the fact that in America, in the Western world, we just treat symptoms. Just put, pump pills. Amen. I, I, we need to get to the root of the problem. Amen. If you fix the root problem, the symptoms will go away eventually. Amen. But if you don't address the root problem and you're just pushing pills, well, you know the amazing thing about pills? Hey, read the label. Could cause this, could cause that, could cause this other, this other, this other, this other. And the, the, the side effects of what you took to fix the, rip, fix the pain is worse than the pain. Right? That's a fact. And then, then you wonder why somebody gets in their 60s, they're taking 19 pills a day. Well, I got to take this one to chase the effects of that one. I got to take this one to, to, to fix the side effects of that one. And then before you know it, I mean, you're just popping pills. And the biggest problem we've got today with drug addicts, it's not the people out under the bridge, it's the people that go to the doctor's office. Can somebody say amen? amen. I had to just kind of pull you back on board. I thought I was losing you a little bit there with the conscience stuff. We had to find some common ground again. So you know, you know what I'm saying here. All right. So the conscience, I said number one, it is given by God it's a compass of the soul, but it has to be calibrated by truth. Second thing, conscience even works with our motives. And I thought this was important because Romans 13 5 says, Wherefore, we must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sakes. In other words, some people do right just because they don't want to deal with the consequences of getting caught. And I told you guys last week, you know what a, uh, the difference between humiliation and humility is? Humiliation is nothing more than a proud man getting embarrassed. That's what humiliation is. A proud person getting caught with his hand in the cookie jar and getting embarrassed. Real humiliation is to be broken in spirit. Well, the same is true here. A lot of people just do right because they don't want to deal with the consequences if I get caught for doing wrong. But the Bible says you shouldn't do that. You should try to do right for conscience sake. Because you're going to have to look yourself in the mirror and you're going to have to see what kind of man you are and that should be your goal. I want to like who I see in the mirror. And I'll tell you, honestly, I don't like who I see in the mirror a lot of times. I really don't. I, I, some, some days he don't look too bad and some days he looks pretty slouchy. And then here's the meat of the message and we'll be done. How do I repair a guilty and broken conscience? So I've told you a lot about what the conscience does. I've told you about how it affirms you or, conv uh, or condemns you. I've told you about it being seared. But, but the meat of the message is this. How do you fix a conscience that's broken? When you violate your conscience, it's broken. The Bible says that death comes by sin. So every time you sin and you violate your conscience, something in you dies. A little bit of your innocence dies. A little bit of your conscience gets seared. And if you keep overriding and overriding and overriding and overriding your conscience, it's broken, friend. And it has to be fixed in order for you to get that compass where it can guide you in the right direction again. How do you fix a broken conscience, a guilty conscience? There is four things that I want to say about this. Number one, you must get honest with yourself. You must get honest with yourself. You might say, well, Brother Gary, listen, that is, that, that's dumb. Who's not honest with themselves? I'll tell you who's not. All of us are not. Every single one of us lie to ourselves. Well, I look pretty good. No, you don't. 
What's that song? You don't look, I, don't look neck, I don't look good naked anymore. <laughs> I mean, put some clothes on that. Get that covered up. No, I don't look good. You say, well, 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 I don't really lie to myself. You really do lie to yourself. You really do. You tell yourself you're smarter than you really are. You tell yourself you're better than you really are. I mean, you, we all lie to ourselves. So if we're going to fix our conscience, the first thing we've got to do is get honest with ourselves. No, it wasn't that... Okay, here, here perfect example. Well, I wouldn't, have, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have cheated on my wife had that woman not been provoked or provocative to me. Well, it wasn't that woman's fault. It was your fault. Well, I wouldn't have told that lie if, if I wouldn't have been pressured. Well, no, it's not their fault. Okay? Are we on the same page? If you're going to fix your conscience, you've got to get honest with yourself. The second thing is you've got to seek to have empathy for the people that you've offended and truly see the hurt that you've put them through. You can't, you can't start to fix your conscience if you allow things to stay broken. You can't do that. I mean... I'm fully convinced this is why marriages fall apart because there's offenses that, that's never been attempted to be made right. And then the second thing, number one, I said you've got, to, you've got to get honest with yourself and secondly, you've got to ask for forgiveness. Now let me tell you what for asking for forgiveness is. Asking for forgiveness is... I, I learned this from, from Bill Gothard. I love this. It says uh, true... A, a true apology makes no demands or excuses. It is not a negotiation. A true apology makes no demands or excuses. It is not a negotiation. You come and you say, I did wrong. And I feel horrible about how I have made you feel. Will you please forgive me? Period. Not, I did wrong, I said something wrong, but I want you to know how, why I said that. No, at that point we've, go, we've got, we derailed. <laughs> it's not an apology now. It's not, a, it's not a asking for mercy now. It's, it's a negotiation at that point. And a lot of people do that with God. They come to God and they say, God, please forgive me. But Lord, you know. Huh? If you wouldn't have put me in, in, with this loser family of mine. If you wouldn't have put me around all these idiots. It would have been so much easier to be good. I mean, I got my dad's an alcoholic. My mom, she's off in Lulu land. Lord God, please forgive me. But you know. No, that's not an apology. That's an excuse. And you're not going to get your conscience fixed as long as you're making excuses or demands. Boy, this is good preaching right here. Man, this is good preaching. Hebrews 9 and 14, the Bible says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Purge your conscience. Now, those of you that are mechanically uh, inclined, you know what purging something, purging a valve is. You, you, know, you know why you have to purge a valve because there's debris or something that's obstructing. Hey, your conscience has a lot of rust and a lot of obstruction, and sometimes it has to have, be purged. Amen? Well, we're going good. We're almost done. The third thing that you've got to do to fix a, a guilty conscience or broken conscience, number one, you've got to get honest with yourself. Number two, you've got to ask for forgiveness. And number three, you have to seek restitution where possible. Seek restitution where possible. You know what restitution is? To make right what has been made wrong. And I say where possible. There's some offenses you can't go back and raise people from the dead to fix something that you did to, to break a trust or whatever. You, you, can't, you can't go back. It's not possible. But if the person is still alive and, and there's possibility for restitution, you have to desire 
to make right what has been made wrong. And you ask the question, how can I make it right? The person that has been the offended is the only one that can grant forgiveness. You see, just because you ask for forgiveness does not mean you automatically get forgiveness granted to you. They are in the driver's seat. They're the ones that have to decide, will I let you attempt this restitution? But that's never going to happen if you don't, if you don't repent first, if you don't ask for forgiveness first. Now, some people, they're not willing to forgive. And all you can do at that point is to be humble, repentive, and, and desire to, for things to be made right. You cannot make someone forgive you. The reason that I'm so excited about the gospel is because God always stands ready and willing to forgive us. The Bible says in 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is always willing, if we come in the right spirit, humble ourselves and repent, He is always willing to forgive us. He never rejects us. And that, my friend, is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every other religious system, regardless what it is, has a works merit-based system. Every other religion. I don't care what it is. It's Hindu, Islam, I don't care what it is. It is a workspace. If you do enough right, then you get absolved of your sins. If you say enough Hail Marys or give enough money to the church, then you can be right. I want to tell you something, friends. Jesus Christ is the only one that offers true forgiveness of sins. Amen. Amen. But if you're going to clean your conscience up, you have to strive for restitution. Now, lest you just say, well, I'm just going to repent to God and I don't have to worry about man. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, Brother Eddie preached about it Friday night, if we don't forgive others their trespasses, God won't forgive us our trespasses. Well, I wish the Lord wouldn't have put that in the Bible. I really do. That is tough stuff right there. You mean I have to forgive someone if I'm going to be forgiven? So listen, when someone does come to you and apologize about something, you do not have the right as a Christian to hold it over their head any longer. You are commanded to forgive. Well, contingent if you want to be forgiven. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can hold on to it, but just your, your forgiveness just went out the window. Well, how can I make it right? How can I repair the hurt and how can I regain your trust? And then the last thing under how do I repair a guilty conscience or a broken conscience, I said, number one, I get honest with myself. Number two, ask forgiveness. Number three, seek restitution where possible. And number four, we must start with clearing it up with God. I, yeah, I'm putting down the script. I absolutely love what John and Tony do. There's guys here from uh, in rehab from uh, from recovering from addictions and various things, and, and uh, they have a heart to try to help people in that and aid people in that in that uh, endeavor. How many guys you guys got at your, your house now? Fifteen guys. That's that's awesome. I mean that that is amazing. And we need that in society. Yesterday I went and met with a parole officer from a gentleman that's wanting to come to church. He has to clear it with his parole officer before he can come. And um, as I testified to that lady, so she said, So tell me about your church. Because she's the one who has to sign off on. And I think that's why this message is so appropriate because it deals, it ties in so beautifully. So tell me about your church. And, uh, you know, this individual, where will they be in the building and who will they be around and all this stuff. And we talked for a few minutes and I stopped her. I said, ma'am, 
I said, I don't know where you stand with God. I don't, I don't, understand, I don't know. I'm not asking you. I don't know you. But um, let me just tell you what I believe in my heart of hearts. The reason that I would be willing to invite a man like this into my church, be around my children, my family, and my friends, and all this stuff, if I just dealt on the physical level, I'd want to put him in a box and never see him again. But I believe in the regenerative power of Jesus Christ. I believe that we must embrace accountability, be responsible, all of those things that give society a comfort level of knowing that this person's doing the right thing. But I told that lady, I said, I've witnessed Jesus change a man from the inside. And yes, while the temptations and there may be vulnerabilities there that would otherwise not have been there, I don't believe that once an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic. I don't believe that once a murderer, you're always a murderer. I don't believe that once a drug addict, you're always a drug addict. Now, do I think that you should let down on being vigilant? Absolutely not. But Jesus Christ can change your heart. I have witnessed husbands that beat their wives turn into the most gentle, loving people that I would feel 100% confident to let a baby be in their arms because God can do what man cannot do. But if all you deal with is on the physical side of things, then yeah, we got to put all these fences up everywhere to my, try to maintain my, my conduct, try to keep me in line. And I hope and pray that I have not in any way said, Miss Tony, what you do is necessary. Because these guys, until they get to the point to where they, they have let Christ totally regenerate them, then we all need those safeguards. And we all need those safeguards anyway. And I would want to always embrace those safeguards. That's the reason that I always say from this pulpit, if I ever preach anything that does not line up to Scripture, go find you another church. Do not take my word. Because I realize that I'm flesh, I'm man. And if I don't get on my knees and let God reveal to me the truth of the gospel, then I don't have nothing to give you. I don't have nothing to feed you. But if it's in the book and we stay with the book, then it holds us accountable. It recalibrates our conscience. It keeps us online. And as I said to that lady, Jesus can change a life from the inside. A big smile came on her face and she shook her head and she said, I know. She had seen it happen. And I told her, I said, I said, I want you to know I appreciate what you do to try to keep us all safe out here. And she looked at me and joy came all over her face and she said, I love my job. You know why? Because she was a part of that repairing process. She was a, a part of that rebuilding trust process. She was a part of that regenerative thing that all of us need. And I know from talking to Tony, that's one of the things that, that, that drives her because she, she knows what these guys go through and she loves helping in them getting their lives back together. That, that, that provide, and that's the reason, Miss Tony, I love preaching. Because I believe that I'm, I'm doing the same thing. People that are broken, people that are messed up, people that their conscience has been violated beyond measure, that relationships have been destroyed. I believe with all of my heart that, that, that God can fix what is broken in people. And where there was hatred, where there was bitterness, God can put joy, He can put forgiveness, and He can, he can help. Amen. So here's the question for you today. Do you need your conscience fixed? Or just recalibrated a little bit? Do you need a total overhaul? <laughs> or do you just need a tune-up?
I've done things this week and violated my conscience. This week, I've said things to people that was unkind. My wife's shaking her head, amen. <laughs> Honey, you want to come up here and pray with me today? <laughs> She's not ready to forgive. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Things are good with Mary and I. This is what I love about church, Brother Brian. This is what I love about church. We get to talk about things that you don't get to talk about in society. You will, I guarantee you, you won't have this kind of conversation at work today. <laughs> You're not going to talk about this stuff. But this is so good. This will give you a good life. Are you going to be driven by the fleshly man? Or are you going to start listening to the conscience? Are you going to let the conscience be calibrated by the Word of God so that the soul can be transformed and you can be the person you need to be? Stand with me if you would, please.